All right, hi everybody. I'm Rich Folly, and you're watching PBS Bookview Now's coverage of the 2017 Library of Congress National Book Festival. The action is picking up here. More and more people around us. It's been an amazing day already. And now, right, we're sitting with Marie Lu, the hi. best-selling author, who's got a brand new series that we're about to learn about called War Cross. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to talk to you again. Yeah. So yeah. you explain War Cross as a love letter to the things that you love most. I mean, yes. this is like a special combination of things. We're talking about gaming, we're talking about virtual and augmented reality, mm -hmm. and we're talking about mystery and intrigue. Absolutely. Can you explain a little bit how the idea came about for this and your own background that led to it? Sure, yeah. Um, well, before I became a full-time writer, I used to work in video games uh, as an artist. So it's always been a part of my past and a part of my passions. I've been playing video games since as long as I can remember, um, ever since I knew that I love to write. Um, so the two were always intertwined for me. Uh, and I knew that I was always going to write a story about gaming. Uh, and it just kind of took the right idea to form for, for me to get to that point. You say, yeah. so you, you, it wasn't the first thing you did though, even though you it came wasn't. out of that industry and you no. probably had some thoughts and ideas. What was it about the germination process for this one just to get there? Why, yeah. what, what was the delay for you to kind of finally take this up? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting you bring that up because my first series, Legend, uh, is actually, it, there's a piece of the world building in Legend that um, inspired the rest of Warcross. Uh, in Legend, Legend is a science fiction, futuristic, dystopian story. And one of the dystopian societies in Legend is a futuristic society in Antarctica uh, that is completely gamified. And I was only able to use a little bit of that uh, in Legend. And I just wanted to build on that and write something else based on the idea of a gamified society where everything you do is a game. Uh, and so that was the original inspiration for it. Uh, and a few years down the road, um, I was just playing around with that idea again. Um, and that, this was when virtual reality started to become a big thing, uh, when augmented reality was taking off, when Pokemon Go was this big thing that everyone was playing. Uh, and I took those elements and fit it together with the idea of a gamified society. And that was the original um, inspiration for Warcross. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Amika. Amika Chen, yeah. your new protagonist. This is a young person who is basically uh, inside the game looking for people who are betting on the game, Warcross, illegally, right. and becomes this famous person because if she's pulled into the game and uh, un without, you know, unbeknownst to her, she becomes like this amazing star and yeah. a part of the whole scene. Um, and then gets drawn in deeper into the whole mm -hmm. thing. Amika, though, as we said a little bit right before we went online, feels a little bit like maybe someone that we know, maybe it's a little <laughs> bit of you and some of Mika too. Can you talk she about is. her character? Yeah, um, I think I identify the most with Amika um, out of all the characters that I've created. And not just because you know she is Chinese American, but because she has a lot of my interests and she makes a lot of the same mistakes that I do. Um, she has a lot of the same flaws that I do. She's very awkward when she's talking about people or she meets someone that she really likes or um, has trouble expressing herself sometimes, but at the same time, she um, she has a lot of pieces of my mom in her. Uh, my mother is a computer programmer, very logical, incredibly smart, um, good at math, uh, and Amika has a lot of those pieces in her as well. In the way that she thinks through problems and how she solves issues that she comes up against, um, and and so Amika is kind of a fusion of both who I am and also who I would like to be. Mm -hmm. You talk about like the way she solves problems. What's different for people that don't mm -hmm. maybe understand that gaming culture or that programming yeah. culture? What is that sort of unique thing that sort of leads to that different type of decision making? Well, one of, um, so Amika has a sleeve of tattoos. One of her tattoos says every locked door has a key. So her father has always taught her that every problem has a solution. You just have to find it. Uh, so she kind of approaches everything in life that way. It's a metaphor not just for code, but for problems in her life. You know, she's growing up as an orphan in New York City alone, um, trying to scrape together a living. Um, she has a criminal history, so she's unable to find secure work, and so she ends up working as this bounty hunter. Um, but she meets every single one of these issues with, okay, I'm going to make a list in my head of all of the solutions that I can possibly think of in this situation, even as things grow more and more dire for her. Um, as the book opens, you know, she's about to get evicted from her apartment, and things are kind of coming to ahead, but um, but she she has a way of staying cool about it and 
calming herself down and saying, you know, don't panic. There's a way out of this. We just have to think about it. And that's the way that she approaches everything in life. Yeah, so the, the idea of Amika is that this is going to be a two-book series. Right. Um, but she is this character that you are rooting for, obviously, and we, we all are rooting for her. But there's, you talk a little bit in one of the interviews I've seen about how morality sort of on the edge when you're uh, you know, sort of hacking and you're playing with things. And in fact, the technology right. is sometimes a couple steps behind morality. Can mm -hmm. you explain that idea to me? Because when I, when I hit upon that notion, yeah. that we're, we're so fast with technology to invent things, but we haven't mm -hmm. always figured out whether or not we should use some of the technology or whether right. it's even appropriate to use. I'd love to have your thoughts on, on where we are today, especially when you get into virtual reality, augmented reality, some mm -hmm. of these things where the uses are not yet clear. Absolutely, um, it's something that I think about all the time when it comes to technology because like you said, it, we are moving faster and faster and faster into technology that we don't really know what the ramifications are. Um, I think it's, it's, in some ways it's never really changed since the beginning, you know, I think humans as a species was born to create things. So from the beginning, we have been disrupting our lives. Um, the printing press, you know, um, the TV, the VCR, all of these things have both enriched our lives and also, um, you know, wiped out certain industries or completely changed our lives in certain ways. It's just that now it happens at the speed of light. Uh, before, you know, maybe it'll take a century, two centuries for something huge to come along. And now we see new innovations every year. Uh, I still can't believe that it was only 10 years ago, 10 years ago that the iPhone came out. Um, and I feel like it was an eon ago. Our lives have completely changed because of this one device, um, sometimes for the better, and sometimes, you know, for the worse. Like, is it, is it a good thing that we are always on our phones? Um, is it a good thing that we are always on social media? It's hard to say because you know, as Hurricane Harvey just happened, so it's on my mind, um, you see social media bringing out the best in people where you can, uh, you know, people are literally texting their way out of, yeah, I mean, tweeting their way to, to being rescued. Absolutely, tweeting their way to being rescued, tweeting donations. I feel like that brings out the best in humanity, but at the same time, you see the dark side of the internet, you know, the dark net, the dark, um, you know, where, people who are doing illegal things congregate. Like this is all on the same platforms. So, um, so it's interesting to think about the fact that we create a lot of things because we can. And not necessarily because we should, it's just a, it's that human curiosity at play. Um, and it's the same with AI, with virtual reality. Uh, so it's hard to say what will happen in the future, but I feel like um, sometimes, you know, maybe we're not making the world better, we're just making it different mm -hmm. and then we adapt to this new difference. And there's this in incredible divide now, so it's, it is moving so quickly, that right. if people who are still kind of figuring out their fat finger texting technique, yeah. but there's something that's gone so fast and so beyond that. We're talking about other worlds that exist now and the gaming culture itself, which is a really fascinating place, yeah. misunderstood and not understood by so many people who go through their life completely not clued into that. So you have this sort of divide between people who are on one side of technology the people who are on the other, and then this other echelon that's really deep into it. Um, right. It just seems like completely different worlds, an analog and digital combination. And we're just kind of milling about. Absolutely. And it just seems yeah. to me like there's like a, a, a barely a connection between the two worlds sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's interesting to think about because, like you said, in our world right now, gaming is a huge, huge industry, but can kind of be, you know, under the surface. I didn't know about, for example, uh, esports until fairly recently. And esports is um, competitive gaming. Right. It's professional There's gaming. Large crowds of people. I mean, massive There's stadiums. Huge crowds. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I just recently went to my first esports tournament. Um, it, not that I was competing. I was just yeah. watching. Uh, but this was for League of Legends, which is one of the biggest games out right now. A lot of people don't know how just how popular this is. Right. I didn't know until I went to the Staples Center and saw it was a, it was a sold out, you know, game for this championship. People were spilling out into the streets, you know, there were like satellite parties all over the place. It, it, you felt like you were watching the like 
<coughs> the NFL, you know, or the right. NBA championships or something. And these people are rock stars in their and world. They're rock stars. Yeah. They have huge legions of fans and millions in endorsements uh, from companies. So yeah. they're a it's absolutely a, a legitimate sport now. So talk about gaming on your end. I mean, you said that you were a gaming designer. What does that mean for people that don't know? And also, can you talk a little bit about sort of the female universe inside gaming and, and, and how that's changing as we go forward too? Sure, um, I've, I've always been gaming since I was a kid. Um, I, my first video game console was the Sega Genesis. Um, my first video game was Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and I played it into the ground. My parents had to confiscate my machine <laughs> and all of that. They locked it in the attic, um, as they locked rightfully the attic. should have. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what ever happened to it. It just kind of vanished. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I've always loved to play games. It's always been a part of me. I didn't know that working in the industry was an option. Uh, just like I didn't realize that writing was a career choice that people could make um, until fairly recently. Uh, when I was graduating, I just kind of serendipitously stumbled upon this video game internship at Disney Interactive Studios um, and decided to apply for it. I got in as an artist uh, and I stayed in the gaming industry as an artist for a few years and it absolutely changed my life for the better. Um, this was my first time being surrounded by other young people who were interested in the creative arts and weren't ashamed of it, you know, loved games, loved to create things, uh, and, and I felt so inspired being around them. Uh, and in many ways, it inspired a lot of my writing um, and helped me get my motivation to write back um, during a time when I was feeling kind of down about my own writing. Um, so, so gaming has been very much a part of my life. Um, as for the, you know, the female aspect of gaming, of course, like many industries, especially like tech, um, gaming is, um, has a lot of problems that they need to addre address with the way that they treat women, the way that they depict women in their games, um, and how much they need to increase the number of women who work in gaming and also play games. Because you know, we were talking about eSports, you look out at the audience and at the number of professional gamers out there, you know, female gamers make up 50% of the gaming population, but you won't see them on the professional circuit because it's incredibly hard to get past the harassment and the barriers to entry. Do you think um, that there would be woman. an interest now, though, in sort of bringing out that sort of, you know, that, that team and finding the right endorsements, but it's still so hard? It is very hard, yeah. There's a lot of barriers to entry, just like there are in tech. Um, I think that it's, it's telling uh, what the percentages say about how many women try to go into computer science mm -hmm. and into the STEM degrees and end up not going there because of these barriers that they face constantly, these glass ceilings, uh, the fact that they aren't welcome in a lot of these courses, let alone in these careers where they are constantly facing a barrage of um, hostility. So. Um, so it's something that definitely needs to change in gaming. I think that a lot has changed in the last few years. You know, people are talking about it, which is always a good sign. Uh, people are becoming more and more aware of these problems, and as a result, we see more indie games coming out that um, feature women um, as real characters, as humans, and not just as the princess that needs to be saved. Um, and seeing it as well on like the AAA uh, side well, as well. So, um, so that's been very heartening to see. Yeah. So I, I said I was going to take some questions from Facebook, and there's a question from Lonnie who asked about the draw for you to the analog world of printed paper books mm -hmm. and the fact that you come from this digital world, but you're very interested still to write these stories on paper, which right. is sort of an old school tradition that we hope never goes away, obviously. But can you talk yeah. about the sort of dichotomy between those two worlds and your draw to that old school storytelling approach? Absolutely. Not gaming or digital, but paper. Paper. Yeah. Um, my first love is always writing and reading. Uh, I don't think that will ever change, and it's because I think at the end of the day, story is the glue that holds together every form of creative um, art. So art, music, video games, it all boils down to story. Can you tell an amazing, compelling story? And I think that's why the written word continues to be and will always be the most powerful because it is story at its most raw. It is just words, it's just the reader in you and there's no technology that's needed. You know, there's no inventions that need to be made. It's the purest form. Uh, and even in something as hyper-digital as virtual reality, as gaming, at the end of the day, you still need a writer who creates the story that everything else hinges upon. 
as with a good movie, you know, you can put in all the special effects you want, but at the end of the day, it's the script that holds together that movie and makes it good. So the book is the grandfather of all of these pieces, uh, and I don't think that will ever really change. And so in, in many ways, they're all cousins to the book um, and, uh, and are tied to the book in some way or form. So, um, so I think that the two are, are, are joined in that way. Yeah. Well, amen to that. Yeah. Well, we've got you at a very exciting time. This is release week for Warcross. This is a new series for you. It's a duology. We have two books. We're going to learn a lot more about Amika Chen in the coming weeks. But I think your fans are going to love it. I know they'll make the jump. And uh, I can't wait to see where you go with the series. Thank really, you so really much. Thank you so much thank for being you. with us. Yeah, thank it's great you. to I see you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good to see you, too. All right, folks, we have lots more coming up. This is the Library of Congress National Book Festival 2017. Stay tuned on Facebook, PBS Book View Now. You'll see many more authors all day long. Thanks for watching.